Hello. How are we doing? Good morning. 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 How are you doing, patients? Doing well, Mark. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for helping us. Absolutely. I was just saying to the team, I wish I could have been there in person, but this is a second best. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have you back next year. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Morning. Again. <laughs> yeah, we're excited to hear you again, patients. It was Mark and I, we saw you in Buffalo, and we okay. raced about you. Yeah, and um, we said, oh, she would be awesome. And then Mark, of course, took the lead, and here you are. So Good. Well, luckily, we have some fresh uh, research to share today, so it won't be a repeat of, of the last one. <laughs> Night. Well, there was so much there. I could hear that again and still get more, you know, glean more from it. So awesome. Happy to have you. Thank you so much. Good morning, Gretchen. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning. I don't know who else is. I can only see that many. Oh, Jeanette. Oh, there's lots of people. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> now I'll go back to mute like the instructions told me. <laughs> I meant to say hello as well. Hi, Gretchen, Rose, Jeanette, everyone. Good morning. This is Dottie with Career Concepts. Hi, Dottie. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Same to you. How's your weather out there? Beautiful today. Well, here I'm in Pittsburgh. Oh, how's it there? Um, we're bright and sunny, and I'm waiting for the snow to melt. And for spring. <laughs> and your Steelers won yesterday and they're 11 and 0. 11 and 0. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, we think so too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how many people do we have on here? Let's see. Hi, Courtney. Hi, PJ. Morning, how is everybody? Good, how are you? Great. Let's see here. I'll give it a couple more minutes here. I just let a whole bunch of folks in, so. Okay. Oh, Greg Peterson's here now, so we can start. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Hi, Mark. How are you? Good. How are you? You all set? We are. Okay, good. All right. Good, good. Well, what do you say? Should we get things going here? Yeah, see some nods? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, we're gonna start off here today with um, County Executive Wendell um, welcoming everyone and giving some background and then he's gonna kick it over to me and then I'm gonna introduce um, patients. So with that, uh, PJ, why don't you uh, jump in here? All right, well, thank you, Mark. Let me, uh... Well, I need to be able to see myself when I talk. I'm like, first of all, first, I'd like to welcome everybody for this 
this uh, incredible event here as we move forward. Um, you know, again, thank you everybody for joining, especially uh, a, a shout out to the team from the CCIDA, Mark Geis, Rich Dixon, Jeanette Labello, Rosie Strandberg, as well as our consultant, uh, who so many I know, well, she went to her, her, her headshot now, but Gretchen Lindell uh, as well, and uh, Sue Kellogg, uh, who are consultants. <laughs> Morning, Gretchen. Um, also like to thank, uh, you know, the steering group who was really instrumental in this, Katie Geis from our Workforce Development Board in Chautauqua Works, uh, Craig uh, Garas Johnson from the BPU, longtime friend of mine, Dr. Tim Piazza from the Manufacturing Association of the Southern Tier. Uh, don't let him fool you, Dr. Piazza has a knack for smoked oysters. Uh, we were never able to eat in lunch, but uh, he somehow managed those smoked oysters in, into our study halls in the morning. But uh, longtime friend, and thank you so much for everything you're doing with the uh, Manufacturing Association. And also thanks to Kurt, Courtney Curatolo, uh, you know, several friends of mine, as we talk about this, and a really unique opportunity here we have for residents, you know, there are people from larger metropolitan areas that want to move back. Uh, one family uh, is actually from Ireland. She grew up here, and when they come to their, the, their, her family's home that they now uh, occupy in the family, he loves it because looking out his window at Chautauqua County reminds him of his home in Ireland. So I, I think that is amazing, and Kurt, Courtney's been instrumental in helping them, um, you know, reach out to certain opportunities here in Chautauqua County. So, Courtney, thank you so much for that. You know, the effort that we're starting here and we're really taking on is to address, you know, we, we know Chautauqua County's lost population over the year, uh, over the years. Myself, I, I'm a product of, um, you know, a relocation. My dad came here with Cummins Engine back in 1977 and uh, 43 years later, here we are. So I think having said that, the opportunity and the history of bringing some great talented people here, not saying I am, but others, uh, you know, that's always been our strong point is, is attracting people. And I think more so now than ever, when we realize the remote opportunities we have here in Chautauqua County, that we will be able to attract those people to work here, stay here, and still be able to work in those larger areas. I'm part of a, uh, uh, a national FCC communication group that is looking at broadband and how we can expand it. So, of course, uh, you know, fighting for our rural areas here and increasing that. So many people have told me, I'd love to come here, you know, but I have to put my hotspot at the end of the driveway to get my connectivity. So we're, we're reaching all those, uh, you know, all those uh, questions and trying to get them answered. Um, but, you know, the beauty, the, the community, uh, the business community's needs for attraction uh, of talented individuals is really incredible as well. You know, we know places like Refresco, Nestle Purina, Bush, Rand, Wells Fieldbrook, Lawson Boater, uh, Lawson Boat and Motor, uh, Phoenix, and so many others uh, have open positions. You know, uh, when then County Executive Barella went out and visited at hundreds of businesses, you realize we have a lot of op openings here in Chautauqua County. So how do we fill those when talented individuals uh, to make our workforce more complete and vibrant here in Chautauqua County? So what a great way to kick off and what a great way to, to get to the bottom of things and to go to the people that have the needs and, and talk to them directly. Uh, so again, this common issue we have here throughout the country uh, with talent attraction, but I'd like to find a way Chautauqua County can capture this. How can we, you know, get our little niche in, in this uh, need and start to attract people? We know, I mean, those of us who are here, you don't have to sell us on Chautauqua County. And the people who come here sometimes don't want to leave because they know what this county is like. So I think it's a, it, this is a great opportunity. I'd like to thank Mark and his team. I'd like to thank everybody here for being part of this. Um, I apologize, I'll be on for a little bit, but uh, today just happens to be one of those days that uh, the word hard stop, I think uh, my secretary put on my desk and, and reminded me that uh, today's one of those days. But I thank everybody for everything you're doing, our business leaders and Mark and your team uh, and everyone who's put this together. Thank you so much, this is gonna be an incredible event. Uh, thank you, PJ, and thank you for your leadership on all of this. You know, I, I uh, inadvertently uh, omitted uh, Holger Ekinger, he's also been a part of the steering group. I, and I do wanna thank the steering group. We met for uh, once a month for um, six or eight months leading up to the original event, um, which as we know was, was planned, I think it was March 18th of last year. So, it, and it was just as the COVID was kicking in and we were contemplating, should we have it or should we not have it? And we decided, no, we're better off not having it. 
we postponed it. We didn't know how long things would take to blow over, um, but obviously they got worse. So, um, you know, we got back together as a steering group and, and you know, we contemplated having some kind of, uh, uh, you know, a conference uh, platform online. Um, and, you know, we, we visited um, and participated in some events and we just felt like, you know what, um, let's, let's do this again. Let's plan it for the spring or uh, the summer after COVID's behind us. We'll have an in-person event. So this is kind of a precursor to that. And we thought, well, why don't we, why don't we invite, um, you know, Katie and I, um, my wife and I, um, and, and we were saying this earlier, um, th that we, we participated in an event in Buffalo last year um, having to do with um, um, site selectors and, and Patience was a, a guest speaker there. And we said, oh, wouldn't it be great to have her come to our community and talk to us about talent attraction? And, and, and so that's, you know, that's, that's kind of one side of the coin is, you know, what is it that young people are looking for? Um, what is it that they, what they want? Is it, you know, salary and benefits? Is it, um, you know, um, uh, fulfillment in their job? Is it quality of life? Is it, you know, um, is it how a company treats their employees? So that's kind of one side of the coin is to understand what it is that talent's looking for. And then on the other side of the coin is really what can companies do to attract people? So we invited uh, ben Rand um, from Insight Consulting to kind of be the point counterpoint or two sides of the same coin, but I think it gives us a good perspective on what people are looking for and what companies can do um, to um, set the table, if you will, um, for, for talent. You know, certainly prior to COVID, um, it was an employee's market, if you will, uh, where, you know, really talent could pick and choose where they want to go. Um, maybe it's less so now, but I still think it's, it's true. Um, so we gotta, we gotta, we're competing, right? That's why my patients calls it talent wars, right? And she's going to talk about that because we're competing against everyone else for that, uh, for that talent. Um, this is a common theme. It's not just in Chautauqua County. When I was in Monroe County for a while, they had the same issue there. I know it's a, a common issue, um, uh, you know, across the country. Um, you know, I, I was part of those 100 businesses in 100 days and have, have visited many more companies since. And inevitably, when you ask them, what is your biggest challenge, they'll say, finding people. And it's not always just, you know, certainly, you know, having trained people um, is, is important. But, it, you know, a number of them will also say, you know, I just need people who are going to show up and try hard and get along with others, you know, and, and, and so, um, you know, that, that's a common theme. Um, so I could talk on and on about this, but um, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going, I'm going to uh, introduce Patience. Now Patience Fair Brothers with uh, DCI, she's going to talk for 30 minutes and then we're going to have a Q and A. Um, and we're going to do that by chat, the questions. Um, and then Ben Rand is going to speak for 30 minutes, and we're going to follow that with a Q&A. So, um, so, so Patience um, Fairbrother is with a DCI, and Patience is a marketing strategist and project manager with expertise in branding and website development. At DCI, she has worked on a broad range of economic development marketing programs from Texas to Netherlands and has been pivotal, pivotal in developing marketing strategies and brands for states, cities, and regions across the country, including those in Vermont, Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, and the Carolinas. Patients' website uh, work for both economic development and talent attraction, which includes uh, businessintexas.com, investinholland.com, um, moveupstatesc.com, uh, and, and, and a number of others, has garnered multiple awards from the International Economic Development Council, the IEDC, 
and the Association of Marketing and Communication Professionals. Uh, Patience has been a featured speaker on place marketing research and best practices at conferences, including, including economics and in energizing rural North Carolina and in communities from Buffalo to Birmingham. She also serves as co-host of DCI's podcast, quote, The Project Inside Corporate Location Decisions, unquote, which features interviews with corporate executive site selection consultants and economic development professionals about hot topics and recent announcements in site selection. So with that, um, um, again, um, you know, we're going to, um, she's going to speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll, we'll open it up for chat. Um, another thing uh, worth mentioning is um, uh, the Talent War study. And I know she's got an update on that where they interviewed um, thousand, you know, 1,500 plus uh, working age individuals. And a lot of her information um, is going to be coming from that. So uh, with that, I uh, open it up to you, Patience. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Um, I actually was planning to be part of the event this past March. I had my bags packed, uh, essentially ready to come for the March 18th event. And then, as you all know, uh, COVID-19 hit pretty strongly, particularly where I am uh, in New York City. So uh, what we planned to present to you was our, uh, our latest Talent Wars study, which looks at what do people look for in jobs and location decisions. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has changed a lot about our current landscape. So. I'm actually really excited to share that we have new research uh, since uh, since March. So we, we have fresh research that actually focuses on what people are looking for now in the COVID-19 era. Um, but before I dive in, I would love to just hear from you all a little bit um, about how you ended up in Chautauqua County. Let me see if I can find the chat box. Sorry, sometimes this is a little tricky for me. But if you could just put it in the chat box, how did you end up in Chautauqua County? All right, feel free to throw it in there. Are you from here originally? Did you move for a job? Born here, marriage, husband is from here. Another husband is from here for the job, husband's job. Move the job, seeing some themes here. Born here, born and raised, husband recruited to Cummings Engine. So excellent. Um, I think you'll you'll find that uh, more these responses come in, the more commonalities you're going to see, uh, whether it's moving for opportunity or moving for connection for family. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about a lot today, because relocation decisions are often a once or twice in a lifetime decision. They're not something that we can get people to make overnight. So there's a lot that we need to consider in terms of the research. Um, but a quick uh, bit of background about us before I dive into the research, uh, DCI Development Counselors International, we specialize exclusively in economic development and tourism marketing. We were founded in 1960 and we've worked with more than 500 different cities, states, regions, counties, and countries even. Um, and traditionally my role has really focused on getting uh, companies interested in relocating or expanding to my clients locations. But about three years ago, we started hearing this new need from our clients, which was that their employers, which are their greatest customers, were having trouble filling jobs. Uh, we were in the hottest job market in half a century, record low unemployment, and that was really where the need was. So at DCI, we kind of shifted our strategy and we started taking on the challenge of how do we attract people, uh, just as Mark was pointing out, is increasingly a challenge. So when we started looking at uh, you know, marketing programs to attract talent, we wanted to really look at the data to begin with. So uh, in 2017, we released our inaugural uh, Talent Wars report, what people look for in jobs and locations. We then followed that up with Go Fish, which focuses on the Gen Z uh, population. And then uh, last year, we did release a second version of Talent Wars, which is what I would have presented to you all um, had we been together in March. Um, but as we all know, a lot has changed. And so we did wanna take a fresh look at things to see where we stand now. 
So this is kind of the state of talent attraction according to the media. Um, less than a year ago, you would have seen a very different picture, uh, headlines reporting on, again, that record low unemployment, uh, skills gap, and now here's what the media is talking about. Uh, we're talking about is remote work here to stay? The pandemic may be accelerating the demand for a skilled workforce. So in other words, is it actually kind of widening the skills gap? Um, looking at how the economy is recovering or not so much in some cases. And then we are, see some we are seeing some locations that are kind of taking advantage of this moment and saying, hey, come here, come work here remotely, try it out and maybe consider moving because there are a lot of people right now who are able to work from home and may be able to do so going into the future. But this is just the picture from the media. Um, we care about that, but we care more about the numbers. So let's turn to the research. Um, as part of this most recent study, we surveyed more than 1,600 working age individuals, so 21 to 65. Um, we purposely didn't focus on one industry or skill set. We wanted to be as broad as possible, um, and as well as education levels. So the only requirement was at least a high school degree equivalent or higher. And then the only other qualification we included is that about a third of our respondents have actually made a relocation decision within the past five years. So that they were really speaking from experience as you all were when you were talking about how you ended up in Chautauqua County rather than sort of in hypotheticals. So I'm gonna share the research with you in the form of five big questions that may be on your minds, they're certainly on our minds, um, and sort of how the research might answer or perhaps debunk these questions. So number one, uh, stay at home means people are staying at home, right? So in other words, if people are quarantining, if they are not leaving the house as much, are they really likely to move across the country or across state lines? Um, people were skeptical about this, I'd say at least to begin with. But in fact, we are seeing a major talent opportunity. So we asked our respondents, if a job fit your skill and salary requirements that was located at least 100 miles away from your current location, would you be willing to move? And 85% said, yes, I would be open to job relocation. So this isn't just a big opportunity. This actually represents a 12% increase in yes responses from 2019. So it kind, of, it kind of looks like people are now more willing to relocate than ever. But we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this question. So the question here is, are you more or less likely to consider relocating post pandemic? And here the picture isn't quite so clear. So only 30% said I am more likely to relocate uh, post pandemic. And that's by no means a small number. Um, you know, the 30% of the population of New York City is something like 8 million. So it, it's, it's definitely not a, a low number, um, but certainly it's maybe not the way that the media is painting it in terms of, you know, everyone in a big city is, is fleeing and looking for new opportunities. Uh, we did have 3% say they've already relocated and would like to stay. And then we had 2% saying I've relocated and would like to return. We, we sort of chalk that up to there might be people who relocated temporarily uh, during quarantine and are maybe making their way back or maybe considering it now. We also wanted to understand what types of locations people were interested in moving. So we asked, is there a particular region of the country um, that you'd be most interested in moving to? And you can see from this word cloud that the answers were really all over the map. Um, so we got everything from Florida to California, Midwest, Southwest, and you'll see here, New York is uh, quite well represented there in the bottom right corner. And then we got a lot of responses that just said anywhere or COVID free area. So people are really kind of throwing out their rule book about where they would consider moving and thinking about, you know, I can really reinvent myself and perhaps my life by moving somewhere right now. So question number two, this has to do with remote work. We've seen a lot in the headlines about this in particular, and I know many of you employers uh, probably already have plans in place or considering, you know, to what extent are we gonna continue remote work if that's possible for our operations? Um, is this something that is gonna be ingrained now as part of our company culture? So when we released this study in July, we wanted to understand what are people currently doing now? So 56% said that they're working remotely 100% of the time, which isn't surprising given that that was um, sort of towards the, the height of the pandemic in, in areas, certainly. Um, then we had 23% saying they're part-time remote, part-time going into their office or their place of work. And then 22%, I'm still going into the office or my facility full-time. Those are likely gonna be your essential workers and, and people who really can't work remote for their job. 
But the most important thing to us was to understand what do people actually want? So now that some of us have gotten the taste for remote work, do, do we like it? it you know, do we wanna see more of this going forward out of the pandemic? So a little bit of an interesting picture here. Um, in terms of the preferred work arrangement, 38% said that they would prefer a mix of working from home and in the office. Uh, another way to look at this is about 75% uh, are looking for some form of work from home, so either a mix or full time. And then on the other side, about 60% are looking for some form of in the office, whether it's full time or part time. Um, so this to us, it kind of says that if communities are focusing only on attracting remote workers, it's not really the full picture because some people really do want to go back to the office, um, especially those of us who are a little more extroverted. They thrive, you know, we thrive off interactions with people. Um, we're starting to get a little bit stir crazy uh, working from home all the time. So um, the fact that you have open jobs in Chautauqua County means that if somebody were to move uh, with a remote job, that they could perhaps find another job if they were interested in going into the office again. So we always like to understand uh, what people place value on in terms of job benefits. Um, so remote work options you'll see here uh, is a little bit lower on the list. It's still got a seven on a scale from one to 10. So by no means low, um, but it's not number one here. Uh, number one consistently across the board in our research have been those really practical and frankly money related matters. So that health insurance, paid time off, 401k, bonus and incentives, and then flexible work arrangements followed by remote work. Um, so again, it's not uh, necessarily low on the list, but it's not the be all end all necessarily for employees. Uh, question number three, this may be uh, perhaps of most interest uh, to a location like Chautauqua County. Um, we're hearing a lot in the media about people fleeing major cities, especially those who are now working remote, perhaps in the tech industry. So the question here is, does this mean the end of big cities? Uh, here are just some of the headlines. The New York Times said, America's biggest cities are already losing their allure. We're already losing it. What happens now? Uh, Business Insider said, the coronavirus pandemic spells the end for big cities again. So we were already reading about this pre-pandemic that there was sort of this uh, flocking of people to um, suburban or, or more rural areas from cities. And is the pandemic actually accelerating this? So let's take a look at what we found in our research. We asked, what type of area are you most interested in relocating to post COVID-19? And really it's a bit of a mixed bag here. And this is consistent with what we found uh, in our previous studies. So we had 35% saying that they'd be most interested in a suburban location. 27% uh, said they would be most interested in rural. Um, so that's really interesting. And then still 25%, so not a small amount, said, you know, I'd, I'd still like to live in a large urban area. And then 13% were saying mid-sized urban cities. Um, just a little tidbit by contrast, uh, we recently did a study with the Site Selectors Guild about corporate relocation decisions. And mid-sized cities really look like they're going to be the future for, for those co corporate relocations. So it's a little bit different from what we're seeing here on the talent side. So question number four, has the, has the pandemic completely changed talent priorities? We always like to understand what are the most important job factors and what are the most important location factors? Um, and this might not come as a big surprise to anybody here, but the fact is that the same two factors that we found consistently in every study we've done remain the same. It's really all about the cash. Uh, it's all about the money for talent. So the top location factor continues to be cost of living. That's the most important factor for people. And then the top career factor is salary. So um, it's about whether people can make a living, they can find a home. It's about those practical matters, not necessarily some of those more intangible quality of life aspects. So let's dive a little bit deeper on that. This slide represents the factors that received the highest score on a scale from one to 10 uh, when we asked, what are the top factors you consider as part of a, re a relocation decision? So you'll see those top three factors, cost of living, housing costs, housing availability. Those have consistently been our top three factors across all the years we've done this study. Um, quality healthcare is also very important and consistently is maybe top, uh, top four or five here. Um, so it's really all about those practical matters to begin with when people are thinking about a relocation. 
Um, and then scoring very high, welcoming friendly uh, local populations. So people want to know, am I going to be able to make friends? And you know, am I am I going to find my community here? Essentially, so that really is important to people. And then you have some other interesting ones like climate, which of course is a little bit subjective. Some people love the snow like I do. Other people would much rather be in kind of a dry, hot climate. Um, and then of course we have alternative job opportunities in the new location. So whether that's for uh, a partner or spouse that you're moving with, uh, you wanna make sure they can find a job. Uh, a lot of you said that you uh, relocated due to uh, a partner or a husband's job. Um, so, you know, what am I gonna do when I get there? And then it's also about, as I said, what, what is my next move? So my current job may be working out right now, but what about my next chapter? Is there gonna be a job for me if I decide to uh, switch my career or switch my job? Um, diverse population rose on the list significantly this year. Um, this could be attributed to the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot that we've seen in the media around that. Um, that's just something we've seen that has been rising in importance uh, gradually over time. So really no factor is unimportant. This second slide uh, shows the factors that received a lower score. But the interesting thing is that the, the difference between the lowest score and the highest score on this list is, is really very low. And the, the lowest one was only a 6.0 on a scale from one to 10. So all these factors are important in some, uh, some way. Um, so we did circle these three factors here, mostly because uh, we were thinking a lot about the, the fact that people, again, are not really leaving home, they're not really able to be as social as they were before. So are people still interested or do they still care about, um, you know, nightlife? Do they still care about art, arts and culture, public transportation, walkable, things like that? And the answer is yes, they, they do still care about it. While they are lower on the list, um, they're certainly part of the picture. Um, but the big takeaway, I think, from all of these factors is that because no factor is unimportant, it's really about how you package your greatest assets as a community. What do you feel you're really strong in from this list and how can you market to um, a demographic of talent that is gonna find that most important? So this is looking at the job uh, on the flip side versus the location. So top factors when considering a new job. Um, and this has always been an interesting one for us um, because we do find that people will move for opportunity. So a lot of you mentioned you either move for a job or move for your husband or partner's job. Um, and that's certainly the case. People don't just move randomly. Uh, it's just not something that people necessarily do. You might hear, uh, you know, colloquially that somebody decided they wanted to up and move to Austin or New York or something like that. Those, those are sort of few and far between um, as far as we've seen in our research. So salary is really the number one factor, as I mentioned. Uh, Work-life balance, company benefits, meaningful work. Uh, these are all things that you as employers are experts at selling to people. Um, location is that factor that where there may be some question marks. Um, it's a little bit lower on the list, but it is certainly important. Um, so in a talent attraction marketing effort, the goal is really to eliminate those questions that you might be getting, or at least uh, give you as employers a better way of answering them. So essentially taking away any of the unknowns so that if somebody says, oh, I just got an offer, you know, in Chautauqua County, and, you know, maybe they or their, their wife or their husband says, where the heck is that? Uh, we want people to come back and say, oh, right, I've heard of that. And I've heard a lot about the great things going on in that area. So it's really about increasing awareness of the location to make the job easier on the employer. So finally, number five, um, how can we help laid off talent? So it's not just about how can we keep attracting people, um, keep filling our jobs, but what about the people whose jobs were displaced due to COVID-19? How can we make sure that the people in our own community aren't suffering? So this is a really great stat um, and one that we've actually seen rise over the years. We ask about, are you willing to undergo training to shift your career? Um, this is sort of the central question when we look at the skills gap and where people are looking for new jobs or maybe are currently employed or underemployed. Um, and how are we going to get them into some of those more in-demand careers? I'm thinking about, you know, welders, software engineers. These are the kinds of careers that are in uh, highest demand across the country right now. And the fact is a lot of people just don't know about these careers. They don't know, um, you know, that they're, that they're viable, that they have, uh, you know, growth potential. They don't know that you can make a good salary coming right out of a community college or technical school program if you're, if you're going to become a welder uh, and make good money. So um, these are the kinds of educating um, 
th this is the kind of educating that we need to be doing um, really as an, as an entire country, but certainly within your own community, because 82% of people said, yes, I would be willing to undergo training. So the hunger for training is there. Um, in fact, we learned that people would even relocate to access free training. So um, if you were to offer, for example, an incentive that said, you know, come move to Chautauqua County, we'll provide you free training to land you in X career or with X employer, that's the kind of thing people would be interested in. And then we had 6.8 uh, on a scale from 1 to 10 say agree, I would be willing to invest in training if it allowed me to upgrade my career. So people are also willing to give their own time and money to this effort. It, it might just be a question of uh, t telling that story to them about why it's, uh, why it's something they, they should consider. So that all brings us to kind of the central question of what does this all mean in terms of how we market to talent. So this is how uh, location impressions are formed. Uh, we asked this question across all of our surveys and consistently these have been the top three. So we ask, you know, how do you form your impressions about a location? Uh, despite the rise of the internet um, and what we might think people are doing when they're staying home, still 59% of people said that they would like to see the place firsthand uh, before they consider relocating. So that really underscores the importance of connecting the, connecting the dots with tourism and economic development because today's visitors could be tomorrow's talent if we can market to them correctly about, you know, cost of living in the area, about the job opportunities that, that are in the area. Um, because once you get people there, as PJ was saying, often they don't want to leave. So we want to try to attract people even just for a visit because this is a really great way for them to inform, uh, to, to form a great impression. Um, followed by that, of course, if they can't see it to believe it, they want to search it to believe it. So 53% said internet research, which means it's all important that you have a presence online that is going to answer those hard questions about cost of living, what are the schools like, um, you know, am I going to find a welcoming, friendly community here? So those kinds of questions that people are Googling, they might be finding maybe negative rankings, um, you know, things online that aren't necessarily super helpful. Um, so creating a, a really engaging platform for people to get those questions answered um, is a great place to start. Uh, and then word of mouth. So people want to hear about this, uh, this place from friends or family, uh, people that they trust. Uh, the way that a lot of us are connected these days to friends and family is on social media. Uh, so we always talk about, you know, if, if you have champions in your region, if you have people who love living there, um, they are your biggest asset because they can be, you know, sharing on social, talking to their friends, uh, their family who live elsewhere in the country, and really um, helping to elevate impressions of the location. So this is really uh, one, of, one of the final points of this, um, and we talked a little bit about this at the beginning of the presentation, but um, ultimately people move for opportunity. So these are the sort of three buckets of, of people that we see that you can help right now. So remote workers, uh, we know that people are interested in relocating now more than ever. We know that there's about 75% of people who are interested in working remote, either part-time or full-time. And we know that there are a lot of companies right now that are offering this um, and might be doing it more in the future as more of a permanent thing. So remote workers is something that Chautauqua County could certainly look to attract. Um, and really the, the piece here, the puzzle piece is that tourism connection to talent. So if you can get them there, if you can encourage them to come for a workation, uh, that's something we're seeing a lot more these days, um, you know, come uh, try it out, stay for a week, work from here. Uh, it sounds like internet may be a little bit of a challenge, so you'll want to make sure that you're um, as much as possible making sure that they have what they need from that perspective, um, but really just allowing them to form their own impressions of the location, which may, uh, you know, get them to say, I'd actually love to live here full time. Potential boomerangs, this is a big one. Um, PJ was touching on this one as well. You know, there are probably people who either grew up in Chautauqua County, maybe went to camp there, have some sort of a connection to the area who might be really interested in moving home right now. So um, capturing those people, whether it's through alumni groups, whether it's through your networks, your friends and family of people who live there, uh, this is a great audience to tap right now and to really put those top factors in front of them, you know, cost of living, um, certainly, but what are the job opportunities and, you know, are there opportunities that fit their skill sets that you can help connect them to? And then, of course, those who are regionally laid off. So again, it's not just about looking externally to um, where can we pull from other markets, but 
how can you help the people in your own community right now who've been laid off? Uh, and the answer to that is really connecting them with reskilling and upskilling opportunities. So making sure that uh, technical school programs are accessible um, and also kind of making the case for for why shift your career for um, really it comes down to uh, the money again as I said so what kind of salary could I make if I trained for six months um, you know what kind of um, job benefits could I have if I just took a little bit of time and, and took this class at a, a technical or community college on the side so um, making that really tangible for the people in your region is another great way to uh, to shift that. So these are the top uh, four takeaways uh, that I want to leave you with before we dive into the Q&A. Um, so number one, of course, talent is more willing than ever to relocate. Um, so even though we did say, you know, only 30% said they're more willing to relocate, it's still worth noting that we saw a 12% uptick in yes responses uh, compared to last year. So this is certainly a trend we're seeing, um, and we believe that it will continue uh, essentially as long as the pandemic's around. Uh, number two, uh, cities are not over. Every location appeals to talent. Um, and this also underscores the importance of working regionally. So if you can package your assets as a region um, and even those areas outside of your county, I know it's, it, you know, a lot of clients of ours fall into the trap of thinking very rigidly in terms of county lines, city lines, that kind of thing. Um, but when somebody's moving somewhere, they're going to want to take advantage of all that the region has to offer. So are there assets just outside the county that are accessible that you could be promoting as well? Um, so thinking about how to make uh, all the different lifestyles available uh, really attractive to people who are looking for different types of living situations. And then number three, full remote is not really the full picture. So while we could start by marketing to remote workers to kind of give them a taste for what this might be like, it's also really important to market the jobs that you currently have um, because a lot of people are eventually gonna wanna go back to the office and if they relocate, they have a remote job and that job doesn't work out or if they wanna go back to the office, you wanna make sure that they stick around. So make sure that you're marketing to them about the jobs that you have open. And then finally, uh, upskilling and reskilling can really win the talent wars from our perspective. We've seen a lot of success um, with some of our uh, communities that we work with in promoting these resources, especially now, um, even shifting those, especially in the hospitality or tourism industry who were really hit hard by the pandemic and saying, hey, have you ever considered a career in logistics or have you ever considered a career in manufacturing and really connecting them with those resources. So those are sort of the top four takeaways. I hope you've gotten some good nuggets uh, of facts out of this. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy to share the full uh, report uh, with Mark after this um, for him to share with you all. But I'd love to open it up now for questions um, and see if I can answer those for you. Gretchen, we have, I'm sorry, um, Patience, we have a question uh, from Tim Piazza. What is the definition of a mid-sized city? So for mid-sized city, um, we had a population of 300,000 uh, or less, I believe was, or was it, I think it might've been 300,000 to, I'm forgetting the exact definition, but 300,000 was sort of the ballpark number we were going with for that one. I can get back to you on uh, the fact. The next question is also from Tim Piazza. The age range sampled was relatively large. How do these relocation factors uh, correlate to age? And does the younger workforce value different things that the more experienced or older workforce does? It's a great question. Um, and interestingly, every year we've done this study, we have found no meaningful differences in the way that age groups respond to these questions. Um, so to that, um, I mean, that tells us really that the same factors are important to everyone. Everyone cares about the practical, they care about cost, they care about healthcare, they care about salary, job benefits. Uh, these are the kinds of things that matter to everyone across the board. Uh, I mentioned we did do a particular study focused on Gen Z, because uh, this is slated to be the largest generation in the workforce. Um, and again, we didn't really find a whole lot that was different, that's sort of interesting to us. But we're gonna continue to look for ways to parse that out and see what we can find. But for right now, the, the answer is really, you know, there are no meaningful differences. Uh, we have another question. This one is from Crystal Sturdick. In the planning world, 100,000 to 300,000 is considered mid-size. Okay, yeah, I, I believe that was the definition. I was completely blanking on the number, but thank you for that, Crystal. Uh, another question, do you know where job seekers are looking for job openings? Um, is it Indeed, ZipRecruiter, LinkedIn? 
Yes, great question. We do uh, include this question in our, in our survey. Um, and across the years, we found that Indeed is the number one uh, source for jobs. So that is typically where uh, talent is, is finding that information. When we look at social media specifically, we asked about, you know, what social channels are, you know, most useful for you in your job search. Surprisingly, Facebook was actually number one this year. That kind of shocked us considering LinkedIn's real focus is on careers, but um, people are, are going on Facebook um, and, you know, perhaps through friends and family connections, finding those job connections as well. So do we have other questions? Not yet. Yeah, I'm looking at that as well. I'm just inviting anybody. I see Tim said, how do these relocation factors correlate to educational background? A great question, and thanks, uh, Tim Piazza, for all of the all the good uh, questions. Um, so uh, this was another area again where we did try to look for those differences to parse out um, because our our sample size is sixteen hundred. It is a significant sample size, but um, in terms of slicing and dicing it, I'm not sure that we can meaning meaningfully say that there are differences. I'll just say from our experience, um, you know, in terms of education levels people who um, have higher education levels, perhaps higher, um, you know, earning, er, earning prospects are typically more likely to make bigger moves. So, you know, to move across the country, whereas somebody who has a high school degree or a clip equivalent um, isn't necessarily going to have the, the means of education to, uh, uh, you know, to get a job where they could reasonably move across the country. So we'd be focusing more on you know, moving across county lines, across city lines, connecting with uh, additional upskilling resources and perhaps uh, jobs. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, uh, wait, hold on. Um, can you talk about the relocation toolkit? That's a sure. question for Monica Simpson. Yeah. Um, and I think you're referring to sort of how, you know, how do you make a relocation uh, easier for people? Um, we've seen all kinds of different approaches like this. Um, namely, we think a talent attraction marketing effort should be kind of broad awareness based to start, but ultimately, um, you know, you, the employers, you are sort of the, the number one focus of, of any one of these efforts. So really equipping employers with the tools they need to sell the location, but also to, you know, ease the transition for employees. So we've seen everything from, you know, traditional relocation packets to, um, you know, digital versions to um, one of my favorites is sort of an ambassador program um, or sort of a matchmaking program where we've seen communities that say, hey, we have this new prospect coming into town. Um, she's from this background. She has two kids, uh, you know, this is, this is the kind of interest that she has. And then they'll pair that person with somebody in the community who has a similar background and can answer those questions. And that's a great way, especially to, um, I think, tackle some of those harder to answer questions like, you know, it, is your community diverse or, you know, are, are the schools good? So that it's not just kind of fluff marketing speak that you're getting somebody who has real experience with that to speak to it and give somebody an accurate picture of what that's like. I'm not sure that that fully answered the question, but I'm happy to provide some additional uh, examples after this. You know, uh, as part of that, patience is part of that. Um, you know, we, we as a county um, are really looking at talent attraction as being one of our um, primary missions as, you know, as, as we move forward here, we created a, something called a partnership for economic growth, which is uh, right. made up of really um, uh, over 100 economic development stakeholders. And we created a, a whole new entity and we've got five different working groups and talent attraction is right at the top of the list of projects that we wanna pursue. So we know as a community, we really need, that needs to be on the front burner as we move forward. So um, That's fantastic. We, have an, we have another question here um, from Crystal Serdic. How much do the availability of education and or workforce training opportunities factor into attraction? It's a good question. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the, the most important factor is probably still going to be uh, job availability. So people want to know they can first get a job at least to land on their feet when they move somewhere. 
Um, but we do frequently also really promote those upskilling or reskilling resources. As we saw in the research, people would actually be willing to relocate to access training. Um, the, you know, the question specifically was framed around free training. So if you can promote those opportunities and perhaps even look at offering some sort of incentive, um, something we've seen some communities do, that can be a huge, uh, huge asset for attraction. So I guess the answer is it's still very important, but the most important thing is still going to be that that job availability and ability to get a job uh, to start with. Okay, another question here from Craig uh, Johnson. Most moving costs are no longer deductible. Are you seeing increases in business support for relocations? That's interesting. I can't necessarily speak to, um, you know, uh, across the board what businesses are doing in terms of relocation, but we have seen community stepping up to actually fill that gap. So some of your, uh, you know, your larger employers might be able to offer a relocation package, but it's probably only going to be for those, uh, you know, higher level managers, executives that they're offering that package. But, you know, what about the people that you're trying to, to fill, you know, those crucial, um, you know, mid or, or lower level jobs for. Um, and we've actually asked a question about, you know, what would be most helpful for you in a, in a location, uh, in, in relocating. And one of the number one things that comes up is, you know, costs reimbursed. So it is something that I think would really help a lot of people, um, especially considering the current uh, economy. Uh, not a lot of people have a ton in their savings account right now to, to make a move. So we've seen a lot of good success with um, communities offering an incentive, uh, sometimes as part of a contest or a larger program that says, you know, if you qualify for this, um, we're going to actually pay to, to move you here. So I think we take one more question here. It was asked earlier from Aaron Wheeler from Coalcraft. How do, how do we use this? Hold on, I just lost it. <laughs> Move down my. Um, how do we use this information when posting a job? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I'd say as a company, um, talking about those top job factors that we looked at. So. Um, you know, if you're able to, or it makes sense to disclose salary, that might be a conversation you have later in the process. But certainly those other factors that we saw rising to the top, which were company benefits, uh, meaningful work, that's one that we've seen rise in importance. So um, making a case for, for why working for your company um, can make a difference, can can make an impact, or, you know, what is, what is this person going to get in terms of meaning in their life by working for your company? So I'd say kind of dialing up uh, those messaging points in your job posts and making sure that you're um, you're playing into some of those benefits. Um, in terms of the location piece, um, again, I think we we typically see that fall more on the community. So it's great to hear that you know Chautauqua is is taking this very seriously. So perhaps when you um, ultimately have some more resources that you can share around relocation um, and those kinds of assets, thinking about you know including a, a link in your job posts and saying curious about hearing more about Chautauqua County, you know, check out this website or check out this brochure, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I hope that answers that question. So two more questions here. Um, uh, one is from Katie Geis and one is from Piazza. So Katie asks, is there any data on student loan forgiveness slash debt assistance as part of relocation slash hiring packages and where that stands on rankings? Yeah, so I'll actually share the, the the full study with you after this that that includes that specific question about you know what incentives would be helpful. I mentioned moving costs reimbursed is kind of at the top of the list, so it's how am I actually going to move here? Uh, student loan forgiveness it's still on the list, but it's definitely a little bit lower, especially now. Um, you know, so I, I I'd say it's it's on the list, and we've seen uh, communities uh, do programs specifically around that. Um, uh, one in particular that comes to mind that was focused around STEM education. So if you had a STEM related degree and you're going to move and they would uh, reimburse uh, you for, I think, a portion of your student loans. So taking a targeted approach like that, we've seen work certainly. So it's not the top factor, but it's definitely one um, that I think people care about. And certainly if you're looking for a particular skill set that requires a lot of uh, education and training uh, that might lead to, to debt for that person, then that's a great option to offer. Okay, um, actually there's a couple more questions here. I think we have time. What important questions have we failed to ask? That's from Tim, <laughs> again. Uh, 
That's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think of, of what other common questions we get here. I think most people are curious about, you know, what what other communities are doing. Um, and I'm happy to to, to give a, a slew of examples of those as well. But I think um, the, the bottom line is that, you know, communities are actively out there right now um, funneling resources into this. So, um, you know, that this is called Talent Wars for a reason. It, it really is a stiff competition out there. So I think learning from what other communities are doing and sort of jumping on the bandwagon, um, because, you know, if you're not doing anything, you're really not even on the racetrack because we have communities out there who are offering money, they have these big marketing programs, all kinds of things like that. So I think the bottom line there is, um, you know, look at what other communities are doing and see what you can learn from them. And I'm happy to share some examples and resources after this. Thank you. Uh, from Kevin Sixby, oh, I just lost again. Hold on, let me go <laughs> up a little bit here. From Kevin Sixby, when looking at the top relocation factors, did you identify any standouts relative to smaller cities and rural areas? I guess who's doing it right? Um, definitely. I mean, in terms of the relocation factors, there's a lot that that bode really well for rural communities or, or smaller cities. So cost of living being the top factor, uh, typically your rural areas, your smaller cities are going to be more competitive uh, from a cost perspective. So that's certainly uh, one that's worth really touting. Um, outdoor recreation was on our top slide, uh, our, our list of top factors, if you remember. So if you're in a rural area, it's stunning natural environment, you know, really playing out the, you know, computer to kayak or, or whatever it is, um, and the ability to access those, um, those elements. I'm trying to think of other ones like that. I mean, probably just friendly local population. If you're in a smaller city, um, you know, here in New York City, I walk down the street and nobody makes eye contact. And then I'll, you know, come visit a, a smaller community and everybody is so friendly and it, it really does make an impact on you. Um, so I think in terms of the top relocation factors, those are some that come to mind for um, that rural and, and small cities can kind of uh, champion. Okay, from Susan Wilson, I recently did a national hire via Indeed and the incentive was driving distance to New York um, State, but lower cost of living. Is that something that Chautauqua County should advertise? Let's see, the incentive. New York City, I think that meant, yeah. Incentive was. was driving distance to New yeah. York State. I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, Okay. I think she meant uh, driving distance to New York City. Should we be marketing that we're within seven hours? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I wouldn't personally play that up too much just because uh, among counties in New York, you're not necessarily the closest. Um, but I think certainly it's worth mentioning and proximity to you know, to other uh, metro areas, even in, in Canada, um, for example, is, is something that is, is definitely worth playing up. But talking about where you are geographically um, for, for talent and site selectors is of the utmost importance. So, um, you know, essentially placing where are you on the map um, is a great starting point for, um, for a campaign. Sorry, I'm not sure I, I answered yeah. that question, but let me know if I can provide any other uh, insights. So I see that we have several other questions, but um, to, so that we can stay on schedule here, um, I'm going to cut it off there. You know, this, again, this presentation will be available. Um, we're recording it. It'll be as a link. Uh, we'll send it out to all of you, send out the link, and then also we'll have the hard copy of this as well. Um, or I'm sorry, the, um, the PowerPoint as well that we can share. And there's um, links, et cetera, in that. So, Hopefully people can take a look at that and get a lot of the other questions answered. So uh, thank you so much, Patient. Um, you're welcome to stick around and hear more or, or drop off whatever you wanna do, but thank you for your insights. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And thanks for all of the great questions. This was such an engaged group and I appreciate your time and attention this morning. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna kick it over to uh, Ben here in a second. And, and you know, it's, I, I, I mentioned earlier, it's, you know, patience is really kind of talking about, you know, what, what, what uh, factors people are considering when making a move. And really what Ben is going to be talking about, again, is what things can companies be doing 
better to attract people. And you know, patients have talked about salary and benefits and cost of living and those types of thing, but things. But when people, you know, and I saw this on my tours, when people go and, and they're considering a company, they're looking at things like, um, you know, what is the company's mission? You know, they want to they want to feel fulfilled in their work. And what type of amenities does the company have? Or do they offer flexible work schedules? Or what is the company culture? Yeah, I guess we encapsulate um, sort of broadly the things that, you know, that people are looking for in the company. So, um, you know, Ben's going to be talking about um, those factors, but also then a tool that they've created to help um, help companies to uh, measure that and um, and get better at that. So um, I'm going to introduce Ben now, and he's going to again speak for 30 minutes, and um, and then uh, um, and then he, uh, Elizabeth Capolo Capola as well from Decision Associates is going to be speaking as well, and then we'll again have 15 minutes Q and A. So um, Ben Rand is the president of Insight Consulting, a local firm. He focuses on business development, innovation, and executive coaching for Insight uh, based on his 20 years of experience in general management and consulting manufacturing companies. Before Insight, Ben was president at Sefer Filtration and a senior, uh, senior vice president and general manager with US Filter a Fortune 500 water filtration manufacturer. Ben is chair of the American Small Manufacturers Coalition based in Washington, DC, a member of the World Trade Center Board of Directors and the lead for the entrepreneurship work group of the Western New York Regional Economic Development Council. He holds an MBA from the Wharton School, I've heard of that, <laughs> and at the University of Pennsylvania, and, um, and a BA from Yale University. Um, and Elizabeth Capola is an executive consultant for Decision Associates. Her key focus areas include best practices and systems in employment, advancement and retention, satisfaction, training and development, performance coaching, reducing costs, conflict resolution, HR and operational efficiencies and constructive management slash relations. She is passionate about increasing capacity and resilience in rapidly changing environments at all organizational levels through change leadership and coaching. Throughout her career, she has embraced the practice of creating and implementing preventative practices and consistency in application of standards, ethics, policies, controls, and regulatory compliance to foster employee trust, reduce complaints slash violations, and mitigate risk. Um, so I think with that, we will pass it over to Ben. Uh, ben, can you share your uh, presentation? I think we're up now, Mark. All right, let me see. Everybody see that? Mine's in the right-hand corner. Uh, Can everyone, can it, I, yeah, I can I can see it, Ben, you're good. Let me see here. Make sure Mark's got it as well. It's, can it, hey, somebody else chime in here. I can't see it full screen. Everyone you can see it. see it. I can see it. Okay, there we go. That's just because I'm not that smart, as you all know. Okay. <laughs> So Ben, thank you and um, go for it. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and uh, thanks for that introduction. I'll make sure next time uh, I don't send you all the details. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, everybody. I'm only gonna talk for a few minutes here. So uh, uh, you, you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, but uh, patients gave us a wonderful introduction to kind of the macro trends that are affecting the market externally. Right? And as manufacturers, that's one of the things we always focus on. Any business needs to understand the marketplace and what's happening. The other thing you're trying to do is to understand how you can contribute to that. What are the capabilities and skills 
that your business has that help you match up with that market. And you're doing that every day to remain successful and profitable. That's really what we're going to talk about now. The other side of the coin. How do you as a business take advantage of those macro trends that Patience is talking about and match up in terms of your capabilities? We all know companies that are uh, considered very attractive and desirable. Uh, Google, high tech leader. Uh, I don't think they have too much issue with attraction, right? But do you have to be a market leader in a high tech kind of sexy marketplace? Not necessarily. Uh, maybe you've heard of companies like Tom Shoes, who have uh, basically focus on the mission of helping the underprivileged. So for every pair of Tom Shoes you buy, they donate a pair. And that's created a real social mission and people want to get involved with Tom's because of that aspect of things. Um, but even locally, there are companies who have very successfully thought about what they do and uh, and the mission that they have and communicated that in a way that has helped them with their talent attraction and retention. A couple of examples I, I will mention who are clients of ours include Boston Valley Terracotta. Now they basically make terracotta building materials. Doesn't sound very sexy perhaps to some of you. Uh, in fact, it's their materials that are uh, the external sheath for the new University of Buffalo Medical School in uh, downtown Buffalo. But they also do terracotta for restorations of famous buildings, uh, things like the Guarantee Building downtown in Buffalo, but also the Breakers Mansion in Newport, Rhode Island, and other very well-known landmarks. And the materials they produce and for these restorations in particular are almost like works of art. So even though they're located in the wilds of Orchard Park, uh, far from the city, they compete very effectively for engineering and other talent because people want to be involved with those products and what they're doing. Uh, another local company, Tapecon, is a printer and converter. Among other things, they make one-time use uh, medical products. Uh, they thought very carefully about how they could help their own people understand the importance of the work that they were doing. And so Steve Davis started bringing in doctors and patients who had used TapeCon products to talk about the impact those products had on the doctor's ability to help those patients and the patient's health. And it really opened the eyes of a lot of uh, the uh, workers at TapeCon to the importance of what they were doing and helped really energize them around that aspect of the business. So, you can be very intentional about these things is the point I'm making. And all of us have a story to tell about our business and the impact our business has. So how do you begin to think about something like this? Um, you know, Patricia, uh, patients did a great job of hitting on some of the keys that we all know, salary, benefits, 401k, company culture. The question is, even though these things are in our control, how should we control them? How can we measure them? How can we understand when we're doing well in some of these areas and when we're not doing well in some of these areas? And how can we move that needle so that we can improve our performance and become that more desirable location for potential new hires or even for our own employees to keep them on board and keep them working and providing that value to our organization? And that's really, you know, a question of, setting a baseline, understanding where you are today, where you need to be, and, and uh, being able to close those gaps in a systematic way. And that's really where our partner, uh, Liz Sipla and Division Associates come in. Uh, so I wanna turn it over to Elizabeth to talk a little bit about how you can begin to think about where you are, how you can begin to measure these things in your own business so that you can start that process of moving the needle and making yourself more competitive, closing the gaps that are gonna make you the kind of destination location that you wanna be, not only for hiring, but for the retention of your people. So with that, uh, Elizabeth, let me turn it over to you. All 
right. Thank you so much. Uh, great to be here. I, I recognize some of the names and faces on today's call. So hello and uh, good to see you from afar as we're all working in a virtual world. Uh, but I wanted to just go over some of the things that I'm going to be covering with you today. And I'm really excited. You're in for a real treat. Um, I do want to just go over a couple of housekeeping items right up front, however, and the biggest one is this, one that I'm sure many of you can relate to. I did embed a video in the presentation, and fingers crossed that it goes smoothly. If it doesn't, it's because I have three kiddos on Zoom for school um, in the other part of my house because I'm having to work from home. Uh, so if the video doesn't work because of the bandwidth issues from three other people on Zoom at this time, uh, then we'll just skip ahead beyond that. But let me just tell you what it is we're going to be doing today. I want to set the stage by going over a snapshot of the new reality. And the reality I'm talking about is, you know, the the undeniable changes that we're all trying to live through, manage through, and wrap our arms around, right, that are impacting our, our businesses and our ability to attract and retain good people. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the pain points that you're feeling, right, about, you know, why is it hard to attract and retain people? And from there, we're going to delve into some helpful solutions. Now, when I talk about helpful solutions, I'm talking about solutions from the vantage point of um, using cultural engagement as a recruitment and retention strategy, right? So uh, as Ben so eloquently said before, it's all about focusing on what the controllables are that you're able to control, right? Control the controllable and not getting too caught up in those things that you cannot control because that's just going to bring you down rabbit holes that you can't impact. So we really want to get you focused on the controllables and on some fairly simple things you can do that can have a massive impact. Uh, so those will be some of the helpful solutions. And throughout all of it, you're going to have a chance to hear from someone who I've labeled a cultural believer. Her name is Wendy Baum. She is from Networking Tech technologies. In fact, there's a picture of Wendy. You'll be hearing from her throughout today's presentation. And uh, Wendy has recently used culture to transform networking technology's ability to, re to, to recruit, to retain talent, and also to maximize the performance overall. In fact, I was just talking to Wendy and her husband, um, who both own the company yesterday, and they were excited to tell me that since instituting uh, and implementing the things that we're going to be covering today, they literally had the most profitable year that they've ever had. So, um, Really excited for you to hear from Wendy. I think that that's really going to be the most exciting part of today's presentation that you get the most out of, hearing from someone who's actually in your shoes, right? Uh, so as far as the perspective that I'm bringing to the table for today's presentation, I think it's important for you to take a look at my background and my experience. Now, certainly you can read, and I'm not going to read everything that's on the screen in front of you, but I just think it's important. Because whenever uh, you know you hear someone's recommendations, whenever you you hear someone's uh, insights, it's really helpful to understand the journey that they walked in their professional career that really formed a lot of that. So what you see in front of you is a little bit of an overview in terms of my professional journey. You can see, um, you know, I progressed up ranks into various positions throughout my career. I've been doing what I do for. Um, Gosh, it's been 22 years. I can't believe it's been that long. It doesn't seem possible. And uh, the various industries that I've had experience in. A huge portion of our client base uh, is in the manufacturing sector. And that is also where I cut my teeth as a human resources and organizational development professional earlier on in my career. So really excited to be spending some time with you today. Wendy, did you just want to say a quick hello to everybody? Um, had to unmute myself. Hello. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today and talk to you um, about something I feel very passionate about, uh, culture. So I'm looking forward to diving in and chatting. All right. Excellent. So let's start with some regional statistics. And I thought it was helpful to take a look at some of the top challenges that 
are being experienced as of summer, a summertime 2020 survey that we administered, um, you know, for regional employers throughout Northwestern Pennsylvania and Southwestern New York State. And um, as of summertime, which I'm positive some of this data has, I'm sure, shifted. As of the summertime, some of the top challenges they were experiencing were, you know, maintaining organizational culture. Huge challenge. Uh, you know, 59% of employers said shifting communication to meet the needs of their workforce. That's been a huge challenge. 50% uh, said that maintaining employee morale has been a challenge. Over half of employers have been facing difficulties with productivity, navigating all the ever-changing leave regulations, and an increase in, in, in need for employee mental health issues, right, um, and services, as well as, the, to be honest. I mean, this has been an unprecedented time for all of us that we are trying our very best to manage through. So uh, let's look at some additional statistics. Uh, you know, 57% of employers have had to either shut down certain aspects of their operation in 2020, or 31% have had to go through periods of completely shutting down their business during the initial stages of the pandemic. And they did have plans to reopen. 96% of employers had to adjust their business practices. And I'd love to know who those 4% were that didn't have to, right? But of those business practices, 61% said that they were no longer hiring. 39% had to lay workers off and 15% had to permanently cut count with no intent to rehire. So you can take a look uh, at these pain points that employers in our own neck of the woods have been experiencing. And I'm sure that not alone, and my, my point sharing that with you is to reassure you you're not alone, but also to highlight the point that it tells us that we need to change right? The definition of insanity, we've all heard it a million times before, right? Doing the same thing each time, but expecting different results. However, one thing that I have found in helping countless employers, just like you, who are desperately trying to claw back and, and make sure they have the right people sitting in the right seats on their bus at their organization and really, you know, contributing in a way that's reliable, that they feel good about to meet their customer needs, is that they're trying to do the same things that worked before March of 2020, right? And guess what? Even some of those things before March 2020 that they were doing, they weren't even really working so hot then, right? But they're still trying to make it work now. So what we really want to highlight is how you can rewrite and play along with the rewriting of the playbook and you can be resilient, you can be innovative, you can be agile. And if you do those things and you keep culture at the forefront of it in terms of your strategy to do so, not only will you be able to weather the storm, but much like Wendy Baum is going to share with you, you're going to knock that storm out of the park. You can have, you actually have the potential to do better than you ever dreamed you could possibly do. So that's what it is that we're going to talk about. So let's set, set the stage a little bit more. I mean, when you think about it, right, we are basically living through a social experiment. At no other time in modern history have we had to deal with so many external factors out of our control that have profoundly impacted the way we do business, the way we service our customers, our mental and physical well-being, uh, the way we live, the way we work, the way we take in what's happening around us, right? So when you think about that, of course it's going to impact your ability to attract and retain good people. How could it not? So let's hit the pause button here in terms of hearing from, from me. And I want to actually kick it over to Wendy. And Wendy, I would love it if you could share with the group the impact that all of these changes and all of these um, you know, external forces have had upon your ability at Networking Technologies um, to attract good people, to retain good people, to be effective in your organization, to service your customers, and overall um, the impact that all these external forces have had upon your culture before doing some of the things that, um, that 
we're going to be talking about today. So Wendy, I'll turn it over to you for a couple of minutes. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, first I wanted to start with a little bit of history. Um, what in regards to what really brought us to being um, dealing with culture, we came into the end of 2019 in um, a bad place. Um, for us, for our company, we had retained quite a few staff. We didn't have necessarily a high turnover. But what we did have was um, when we did hire, we were quickly losing new staff. Um, so there was a, a bit of high turnover there. We were dealing with um, everybody staying in their silo, not working together, um, which was creating issues in our customer service. Um, and we're all some pretty bad morale for no you know, apparent reason, it just was continuing to be. And um, I set out saying, you know, like, we got to do something like this, we need to be more intentional, like, how do we fix this, because this is not working for us. Um, it was, we had interviews where we were interviewing people, putting job offers in front of them, and they were using that interview to nav to negotiate with their current employer and had no intention of coming to work for us, which was horrid in an investment of time and effort and having to start the whole process over again. Um, it was just, we were in a really bad, funky place, and I needed tools to move our culture, and that was before COVID hit. Um, so that's where we started from. That's where we launched from. And I don't think we were unique in that um, place. We were in a place where we had younger employees and older employees, miscommunication, um, assumptions that um, a younger employee was being lazy and wanted everything to come easy, um, which I wasn't a I'm not fond of as a mother of 20 year olds. I do not believe I raised uh, children to be lazy and lack work ethic, but definitely could see that we had significant communication issues and definitely could see that we, as a company, had very defined mission, vision, and values, but we were no, in no way, shape, or form adequately communicating those. There was no buy-in. Right, excellent. Thank you very much. And and Wendy, as she stated, said she's they started working on this before the pandemic. But Wendy, I don't know if you realize this. March 11th was the date that we kicked off the work that we're actually highlighting today. March 16th is when everything shut down from the pandemic. Yeah. So they were truly going through this in real time as the pandemic was unfolding. So here are some things that, that you can expect, right? Your candidates have changed, your employees have changed, heck, you have changed, right? I mean, all the reasons you see on the screen in front of you are exactly the reasons why they've changed. It used to be, right, where um, they requested flexibility in various areas, but now guess what? It's being demanded. And what are we supposed to do with that? Because we have a business to run. In addition to that, childcare is a massive issue a massive issue and um, more so than it ever was before, right? Um, for obvious reasons related to the pandemic that we won't rehash because we already know what those are. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, stress and burnout is a serious concern. And the additional time that, that we have all had, our employees, our candidates, you and me, that we've all had to spend with our family and just reflect upon um, you know, everything that's happening around us and all the uncertainty and what do we do with it, it has really shifted the way that your candidates and employees are looking at your careers, right? Um, at, at their careers. And again, not just them, it's shifting the way that, that you and I are looking at our careers as well. Heck, you wouldn't believe the uptick we're seeing in terms of executive search because of people who were close to retirement age when all this went down and they decided, you know what, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I can't do it. I won't do it. So um, really, when it comes to your guide to creating a culture of engagement that delivers results in the areas that are creating pain points in your organization, 
it all starts with being intentional. And I believe I heard Wendy say that word just a few moments ago when she was chatting with you. But when you look at the definition of intentional, it's being performed with awareness, done deliberately, consciously, or on purpose. And much like networking technologies, I'm sure many of you, in fact, most of you have values, a mission, a vision, um, you know, you have things that, that are there that are offer decent bones, right? To be able to have a culture that, that um, delivers results. But what you're lacking is really a methodical, deliberate approach and self-awareness because look at, there needs to be awareness, self-awareness of what your starting point is so that you can be laser focused on what it is you need to focus on deliberately, consciously, and on purpose to deliver the results in the areas that you so desperately need to see them. So intentional is really, um, being intentional is really the starting point. And, you know, I have to tell you, what we are seeing repeatedly, and, and I am working, honestly, more hours than I ever have in my career, helping people just like you. And I'm no different, by the way. I'm no different than you. <laughs> but helping people to figure out how to build and sustain a culture that will attract and retain the best without bleeding themselves dry, right? Um, in terms of all the resources of time, effort, energy, buy-in, um, you know, that it takes to do that. But I'm going to tell you, I promise you, it is impossible. The one thing I'll guarantee you is that it is impossible to see results if you are lacking intentionality, right? There are no lucky breaks. It doesn't happen. You definitely need to be intentional and have a plan and be completely self-aware of your starting point. And when we think about that, uh, I want to tee up a video that I'm going to be um, asking, asking um, you know, Rosie to start in just a minute here. But when you think about it, right, your culture is not just a fancy little uh, poster or something that appears in the handbook or something that your executives give as a rah-rah speech um, <laughs> once a year at your annual meeting. It really is about what the people in your organization believe, how they behave, and what their overall experience is, right? And how they deliver that experience to your customers and to your candidates especially when times are tough, much like we're living through now. So think about it. And this is a rhetorical question I want you to reflect upon when you hear uh, the, the two, two and a half minute video snippet that I'm gonna show you. What does your culture at your organization look like? What does it act like? And what does it feel like? So I want you to think about that. We're gonna hear right now from Urban Meyer, and you might not know who he is, so, uh, but I'm sure many of you do. But for those of you who don't, he is actually a retired football player and also was the coach of the Florida Gators and Ohio State University uh, until recently. In fact, I think I just saw in the news uh, within the past day that, I don't remember what team, but someone is, uh, there's chatter of him possibly getting back into the coaching game and coaching a team. Uh, but anyways, I want you to hear from Urban Meyer, Meyer's perspective of how culture impacted his ability to lead and attract and um, retain the best of the best in his organization on the football field. So Rosie, if you could get that started. Just taking a second to pull up your video. That's okay. Um, you know, as Rosie is pulling that up, I uh, we're we're gonna really build off of what you hear, and I'm gonna be asking you to really, as we transition into the solution that we're gonna focus on focus on for you for the remainder of our time together. I want you to really think about what element that he is speaking about that you can actually relate to. Okay. Thank you, Rosie.
Can you hear it? No. No. Rosie, Rosie, you need to stop the share and then reshare it. And on the lower right hand corner or lower left hand corner of the screen, there's an option to play computer audio. It's not going to let me do it without an audio, uh, without an echo. I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry about it, Rosemary. So, um, or Rosie. So, so let's move on. Let's move on from that. Okay. Um, you know, basically what, what he was talking about is how important it is to, can, can you all see my screen again? Hopefully. Um, so what he was talking about is just the difference that it made on the football field, right? To, to really be intentional about the culture that he wanted to set and really get his players and get his team and get his coaching staff and get the fans um, at home and on the field in the same mindset in terms of what that culture was. Because guess what? That is what really, really brought forth performance on the field. Okay, so um, we're going to now transition to the solutions that we want to highlight. And the two solutions that we're going to highlight the most are number one and four, which you can see on your screen, a cultural assessment, and then some pulse surveys to monitor measurable progress. Now, we are giving you enough information so that you can also be mindful of items two, three, and five, which are very important. But for the, you know, from the perspective of getting you focused on what's most important um, to get started with, so that, because remember, where does this start? It starts with self-awareness. I wanna really spend time highlighting cultural assessments and pulse surveys. So a recommended best practice that I am sharing with you is a cultural assessment. You might be thinking, okay, whoop de doo Elizabeth, we've been talking about these since the 90s. Well, I'm talking about doing this in a little bit of a different way. I'm talking about doing this in a way that truly gives uh, a measurable, quantifiable uh, picture of where your organization falls in a lot of different areas related to how your employees, um, you know, how they're engaged to really perform highly. And um, not only that, but how you're set, set up to attract and hire the best people, keep them and get them highly productive as soon as they get on board. And if it's done properly, it's not just a nice cute to do that you do once a year if you're lucky, but it's something that gives you really meaty, substantive, actionable insights that are meaty and substantive, but yet simple enough so that you can be really focused. Um, this is an example of what I'm talking about, right? So this is just a little snippet of what, um, you know, of, a, of how we quantify culture. How about that? you get something called an overall culture index. And it is based upon how the people in your organization responded to the question. And as you can see, it is laid out in a heat map index kind of way, right? So green is good, yellow or orange, depending on how you see it on your screen, is, eh, you know, you wanna be a, pay attention to this because it's, it's, it's on the cusp of uh, going into the red. And red is an area that really needs desperate attention. You'll notice there are three different columns. And uh, the way it works is this. The middle column, this represents how people in leadership roles answered the questions. The right column represents how people, um, you know, the general employee population answered the questions. And as you can see, it, you get then an average to come up with your overall cultural index. Not only that, but you can very clearly see, oh my gosh, wow, look at where there's disparity, like right here, right? 100% of leadership thought, yeah, morale in my part of the business is good. We're positive about the future. I would recommend working here to my friends and family. So 100% of the leadership team members thought, yeah, things are going great, right? Uh, I'm happy about the opportunities to advance my career here. But take a look at the difference, right? The general employee population did not see it the same way. So um, there is quantify culture. And without quantifying your culture, you're not going to have, number one, an accurate view of where you're starting from. 
and it's going to make it impossible for you to be effectively intentional about driving improvement in the areas that impact your hiring practices, onboarding, retention, and performance, right? So Wendy, if you could just take a couple minutes and share with the group, um, you know, some of the most helpful findings from your cultural survey process and how you use those to improve your ability to attract and keep good people. Yeah, so the beauty of the culture assessment was really having real and measurable data in front of us that we could work with. It really gave us that, it removed the guesswork and gave us that insight of, oh wow, I didn't think people felt that way. Um, we can guess at it, but this really gave me real um, information about where we were falling short, some of it was a surprise, and where we were excelling and how we can build, you know, areas of opportunity and where we can maintain or move the needle, build a little more. So um, through that, because of that culture assessment, we were able to have a real insight to what our workplace looked like, what people were saying around the water cooler behind closed doors. Um, and it was concerning and it was time to pivot and move. So part of that, in, we were very intentional um, in, in our planning and our building. Um, we took low hanging fruit first, built on that, and it started moving the needle to a positive place. And I could see that. Um, we could see that as we, like all of a sudden we're in the midst of a pandemic. Our, our workplace went 100% remote. Um, we still um, provided essential services. So we, like many, had to figure out what that looks like, who we were exposing, how we were handling that. We had employees who were managing that online education with children at home. So there was a whole lot happening and I just put out this huge questionnaire asking everybody how they felt and they're all sitting around going, okay, we told you, what are you doing now? So not only was it insightful, but it brought about action. Like I had to work with the team and come up with real and meaningful action. And I knew what direction to take. The, the culture assessment told me where those critical areas and what I needed to address ASAP. You're muted, Elizabeth. Okay, there, I'm unmuted now. Um, so, so the other best practices, which again, you're gonna all get a copy of this slide deck and if it, you can take a look at this. I really wanted to highlight um, the two areas, the assessment and the pulse surveys as a starting point to understand your um, current reality. You can take a look at this and I'm happy to answer any questions about this. Um, and further analysis of your current state, you know, really leveraging that data and understanding what specific actions for improvement you can weave into, you know, driving results. But I want to now shift to the other featured best practice, and that is pulse surveys. Now, pulse surveys are very fast. They're very brief um, and frequent surveys that are nothing like the lengthier, more complex questions from the annual survey, but what it does is it actually gives you measurable insight into the progress that you're making towards the improvement uh, areas that were highlighted in your survey. And without this, you're not going to have the consistent momentum in preparation for the resurvey of your organization a year later. And at the end of the day, you're not going to see the results. So, this is really, really important to, to have that Pulse survey. Um, you know, Wendy, I, I know we have about three more minutes, um, you know, for our presentation, which is, which is fine, but I would love it, Wendy, if, if you wouldn't mind as you're wrapping up, okay? Um, I would love it if you wouldn't mind talking about how pulse surveys have helped you and, and just touching upon some of the questions here um, on the screen that really will give everybody an insight into, um, you know, how you've used cultural engagement as a recruitment and retention strategy. So uh, if you could just take a few minutes and touch upon these, that would be great, including of the pulse survey. 
Yeah, so um, we were blessed enough to, um, since uh, COVID hit, we have hired five people. Um, we were able to attract talent from one of our biggest competitors. Um, and uh, we were able to attract uh, talent from one of our biggest um, competitors as far as um, as far as recruiting technical help. Um, and we were able to do this um, because we had in this time frame, because of the pulse surveys, because of measuring, because of tweaking and knowing we are making movement, we were able to put in front of um, these people we were interviewing, like things that interest them because we knew that because we knew it we heard it from our own net techs that were working for us from our own staff they were giving us that valuable feedback not only that we were engaging them in the hiring process so they were being champions for working for networking technologies um, and through the pulse surveys in the culture assessment not only were we able to shift we started shifting morale right we started seeing community um, our employees were engaging with each other. They were bringing customer service where they were working in silos. They're now working together. Even in this remote environment, we're no longer in an office where I can knock on your cubicle. We're in this remote environment, but we're working better than ever because we all have an understanding of what that common goal is. Um, we've had employees turn around who were the bad attitudes that were making our culture toxic all of a sudden they're like oh wait that's not working anymore they're engaging they're productive and the new hires are like beating the drum telling them how great they are at supporting them and getting them going and it with the system and they're a great resource we've had people who like we're sitting in a situation where we're going to have to let them go and this communication this assessment this talking and really driving down to fixing what was broken understanding where our opportunities were have turned this employee around who is now a vital part of our organization so i can't speak enough about being intentional with your culture about taking advantage of tools like culture assessment and pulse survey they were incredibly informative and it really set the road work for what we needed to do as an organization to bring about meaningful work to each and every one of our employees but not only that but to attract people into our organization that's all i have <laughs> when Wendy, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for inviting us to speak. I, I wanna make sure everyone has a chance to ask questions. So we're done with our formal uh, program and, and I'd love to turn it over to everybody. So, so thank you, Ben, Wendy, Elizabeth. Um, that, that was very helpful. You know, I think about uh, that, what is it, six sigma, that, that, that statement, you can't have management without measurement. And certainly understanding um, what people think about that, that culture um, within the organization is important, whether you're a sports team or whether you're a service provider or a manufacturer. I mean, people have to, um, you know, like what they're doing, I think, um, uh, in order to retain them and to attract others. So, um, you know, certainly the, uh, the survey method is, is a, great, uh, a great start, I think. So we're going to open it up here for... Um, for questions, um, please enter them in the chat. Um, we've got a few minutes here. Except Tim Piazza, right? He already used his maximum. Yeah, yeah. yeah he met his quota already. I used all mine up. Yep, yep. <laughs> Hi, Tim. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, this is tougher for me. Numbers are easy. People and feelings, that's tough. Actually, Wendy, do you want to just quickly respond to that? Because that is something that everyone is experiences. And Wendy and Jim are no different. Uh, they, it was tough for Jim. Uh, her husband also owns the company to get his arms around this. Do you want to just quickly speak to that, Wendy? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was um, butting heads. When we arrived at the doorstep uh, to speak with Elizabeth, I was really butting heads because Jim is like real measurable number data. Give me, 
he needs that. And I'm like, no, but I feel like, and I know, and I can tell, and da, da, da. And we're like, this. Um, and when Elizabeth said, I have a way to measure that, I'm like, excellent. And it has meant everything. And it was a hard ask, like at the beginning, um, to say, like, I really want to invest in this. Um, but the data, like, I wish Jim could join us on this call because he will tell you, like, he's a full on culture believer. It has turned us around. We, like Elizabeth mentioned, we have had the best year ever, going from one of our worst years ever and going into a pandemic and having one of our best years ever. I told you we hired five people and we're gauged to one hire at least three more within the first quarter of uh, 2021, which is unheard of um, for us to hire in the first quarter. Um, so acknowledging people and seeing people, it's not all touchy feely, like the numbers are there. And when you meet people where they're at and you give them meaningful work, you will explode. Your business will explode. There is buy-in. They want you to succeed. They want to do well for you. And when you're both on the same page, your environment flourishes. Okay. Um, well, I don't see any other questions. Uh, oh, hold on. Uh, okay, we have a comment here from Elizabeth. The key is measuring your culture in a quantifiable way as opposed to doing a general survey focused entirely on feelings, which are much more subjective. Good point. A hundred percent true. Yeah. Okay, so, well, thank you. Um, you know, and I should have probably done this up front and, Mark, you know, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there is one question. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Can you explain some, this is from Erin Wheeler from Colecraft. She would like you to explain some specific actions you took to improve your culture. Good question. Um, so one of the actions we took right away was we did not have a good um, onboarding process. It was not intentional. People just kind of got thrown into the fire and like make it work. So we built out an actual onboarding experience. We're very intentional about that. Um, we started making sure we were building agendas for a meeting. Um, and so people knew what they were responsible for and bringing to the table. And um, one of the easier things we did was we established a shout out program. I utilize a tool called Yammer where throughout the week we jump on, we recognize our coworkers for various things that they've done. I often tie that back to a monthly value that we have for our company. I highlight at our Monday morning meeting, which we have every Monday that's about 15 minutes long. And we, um, and then I do a raffle and I send somebody a prize to their home. I've been drop shipping since we are in this remote world. And um, it's very simple because I really try to be intentional about what I'm sending and we do a show and tell what you got. It's fun. It's just, that's fun. And it was a small thing that I could do um, that was easy. So those are just some of the smaller things. We've built even bigger programs from there, but we just started with like, what is absolutely not working that it's, wow, I, why didn't we think that through? Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. And Mark, I might just jump in here with a comment um, because I think Wendy made a key point that uh, once you start to measure these. But you're on mute. Oh, how's that? Okay. <laughs> okay, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to build on something that Wendy had mentioned because I think it's an important point uh, that once you take this step, once you start soliciting this feedback from people, once you start to look at your culture, creating an expectation that you're gonna do something about it, uh, that there's gonna be some action taken. And uh, you could actually be in a worse position if you don't follow through and make changes than you would have been if you hadn't begun the process. So the one caveat here might be, uh, just as we wanna be intentional about everything, uh, don't take this step unless you're committed to also making changes that are gonna improve your culture. Yeah. 
Yeah, no doubt. Very well said. And I, the last thing I'd say, piggyback on what Ben just said is, you know, if, if you hear those words that he just spoke and you think to yourself, oh, am I really, I don't know, can we really do the things that need to be addressed, um, you know, that, that come up, that, that are definitely going to come up? I would ask you to look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, take a look at your financials, take a look at your bottom line, take a look at the pain points, take a look at the resources that, um, you know, that, that are being wasted and ask yourself, is this something I'm okay continuing into 2021? Um, you know, and if, if, if it is something that you're okay with, um, because you have bigger fish to fry, great, I get it. But if it isn't, and you just have felt like there's no answer and you're not sure where to turn, this has a hundred percent of a guarantee as long as you're willing, like Ben said, to act upon the data that is uncovered. Well, there, there are examples from um, when I visited manufacturers and, and, you know, things like, you know, giving um, employees, uh, letting them work, uh, you know, four day weeks instead of five day weeks during hunting season or, or letting, letting the employees bring some of their own work into the, into the workspace to, to work on um, or, you know, improving, um, improving the break area, slapping a coat of paint on the, on the, on the walls, you know, things like that, that, that show that, that the employer cares about the employee. Um, so I think there are a whole range of really low hanging fruit to maybe more, um, you know, more expensive things that would need to be done or maybe touchy feely things. But I think there's a whole range of things that, that are across the board that can be done to uh, improve that culture. When I was in, when I was in Rochester, I, you know, I visited uh, Wegmans and I saw what they did. I looked around and it's like, wow, this is incredible, right? No wonder why, um, you know, they, they, well, they, they've got a great culture. Uh, they don't have problems hearing people, um, you know, or retaining people. And, um, you know, that's just an example, but um, certainly there's, we could all get better at that. So, uh, Mark, can I just say that the majority of the work that we did, like once we did the assessment, the work we did after that, wasn't a huge investment. The investment was our time. Um, the investment was taking the time to focus on our culture. That was the biggest pushback I even got from our leadership. It's like, oh my gosh, like what? You want an hour long meeting or two hour meeting? Guessing what? Um, that was the hugest, the biggest investment for us. It wasn't so much financial. It was actually taking the time to be intentional, to have those discussions and to come up with a game plan and make a change. I have a question here from Jeff Molnar. Um, he asks, how can a smaller business, which we have any of in our county, raise cultural awareness? And then he was wondering what resources are available to them. That's a great question. Uh, maybe I can take a crack at that, Mark. Um, you know, Insight is specifically set up to work with small businesses, and those are the vast majority of the companies in our Western New York area, and in fact, uh, in most places in the country. Um, so it is possible for small companies to tackle these things effectively, and I think Wendy's a great example of that. In terms of resources, uh, there can often be um, grant funds and, and other monies that may be available depending on the area um, that can offset some of the costs that might be involved in doing one of these things if you're not going to undertake it on your own. If you want to turn to somebody uh, external who can bring that expertise to you. Uh, one thing I thought I'd mention, Mark, is that there's the potential for us to do um, a small trial, if you will, um, potentially with, with some funding assistance. Uh, we're still working out details there, but if any of our listeners today are interested, uh, they can reach out to us, uh, either contact you, Mark, uh, me, uh, Elizabeth, and let us know of your interest. And if we can uh, put this together, we will uh, reach out to you on that score. Great. 
Yeah, we're, we're looking at doing maybe a, a kind of a pilot program where maybe we get a half a dozen or so companies that would want to be a part of, of undertaking this process and, and then measure it. And then being, you know, obviously we want to help those businesses, but then being able to kind of take that and leverage that and seek further resources to do it on a much larger scale. So that's what, um, that's what Ben's talking about. Okay. So, um, in the interest of time, you know, we probably should have done this up front, but, um, you know, I wanted to, to thank all of our sponsors. Um, you know, we had the IDA, Chautauqua Works, uh, Jamestown Community College, the SPC at JCC and Mass um, were sponsored, but also we had champion sponsors, the, um, the IDA, Phillips Lytle, Jamestown Container, USI, Jamestown Plastics and Cummins. And then we had a number of other smaller sponsors and, and, you know, we'll be um, certainly uh, recognizing all of you um, when we do the in-person um, uh, forum uh, next year. But, um, you know, I want to thank the county executive. I want to thank um, the speakers, patients, um, Ben, uh, Elizabeth, um, and, um, and our friends from um, Wendy Baum from um, Networking Technologies, for sure. Um, and I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank Gretchen Lindell, um, especially, um, and the IDA staff. So again, we'll be, um, reaching out to all of you again in the, uh, in the sometime next year, uh, post COVID and, um, looking to do a, an in-person, um, uh, forum that's more of a matchmaking, uh, format. So thank you everyone. We appreciate it, and um, let me know if you need anything, okay? Thank you, Ned. It's been great. Thank you, Mark. Thanks Thank for focusing you. on this nice important job. issue. Thank you, and happy holidays to all. Thank you. Bye.